So for in-class exercise number four, we chose our topic to be software engineering. I'm Hannah Vest. I'm Bridget Larcher. I'm Megan Hammonry. And I'm Alex Lamontagne. So for our group process, it kind of started with a bunch of confusion, and we weren't really sure what problems and types of questions we should focus on. So we kind of had to ask Professor Ellis, you know, what um, are the types of questions we should be using? And once we had decided that it was the type of questions that we went over in class when we talked about software engineering, we decided to narr narrow it down to four different aspects um, within software engineering, including design, organization, testing, and debugging. And so then we ran into the problem of actually making the questions, and we had to think about the fact that we're treating our audience as beginners, so then our problems became easier because even though we've been taught how to write code well, it was easy when we could just write, make up problems where the code was written poorly. So com software engineering is kind of the reason that we're all sitting in this room, and it has to do with creating and managing software systems, making sure that you have reliable and maintainable code that satisfies the customer's needs. Um, it allows for a lot of electronics, including computers, smartphones, and even some cars today to run well. And the bulk of software engineering is implementation, but in order to have well-written code that's um, reusable and understandable, you need to utilize the other aspects of software engineering, um, including design, organization, and testing and debugging. And so design is kind of the blueprint of your code and helps you know exactly what will be implemented. And the main design component, components are the user interface and system design. The user interface has to do with making your um, program user friendly and overall aesthetically pleasing. And for the system, it's when you map out all your classes and methods that you'll be doing. And the easiest way to do that for visualization process is a UML diagram, which you plan out exactly what will be designed. This goes into our first problem, which is based on design. So your coworker is working on a piece of code that could make or break her career. And she is asking you for advice on plans as to how she's preparing to implement her ideas into the bigger picture. She tells you these ideas about, your, about her design layout, and I'm gonna read these off. Just think about y what you would do and what, we, what you would not do in your code. So number one, She's making getters and setters for private var variables so that she can use them with other classes. Number two, she is planning on making many variables so that she doesn't have to worry about missing any piece of information that she might need. Number three, she's naming variables things such like in x, string n, and boolean ants so because she wants to focus more on the bulk of the code. Number four, she is splitting her information into the, into the optimal amount of methods in order to keep herself organized. And number five, she is planning on writing all the code first before testing so that she isn't interrupted when she's on the roll. So which ones would you advise her to avoid? Which ones would you, would you advise her to keep? And how would you reward the, the ones that are wrong so that she, they could be construct, constructed instead of her full source or project? So the ones that uh, I would keep are number one and number five, or number four, which are she is making getters and setters for private variables so that she can use them with other classes, and she's splitting her information into the optimal amount of methods in order to keep herself organized. And the other ones, number two, numbers two, three, and five, could be rewritten as She's planning on making many variables so that she doesn't have to worry about any missing piece of information that she might need. And number three, she's naming variables, um, things like, um, so number two, she could reword that as she is naming, she is using the optimal amount of variables so that she doesn't have to worry about any extraneous information or data that she uh, does not need. And number three, she could reword that as she's naming variables um, meaningful names so that she doesn't get confused when implementing her code. Number five, she is right, she's testing while writing her code in order that, in order 
so that she can figure out what's going wrong within, within her methods before she gets messed up throughout writing her code. All right, so the next step after you're finished with your design process is to implement it. So what this is, is when the software engineer takes their design blueprints and they turn them into code. So there are three principles that are important for every software engineer to follow when they are creating their code. The first one is to make their code loosely coupled. And what this means is that their code and their methods and their classes are not highly dependent on each other. They are not overlapping. So you can see in this very simple system that loosely coupled means there's no overlapping. And what this allows is for you to easily modify and change your code without causing any errors. So the next big principle that every software engineer should follow is to use encapsulation. And what this is, is where the software engineer will create methods called public getters and setters. And what these methods do is they, they allow the user to <coughs> access your private data without being able to manipulate it. So the system here, we have a object, and in this object we have private methods and public methods, which will be the getters and setters, and you can see that the user can only interact with the public methods. So the next principle and the last one that is very important for all software engineers to follow is to make their program highly cohesive. And what this means is that every method in every class has one function and one function only. So you can see in the diagram of highly cohesive that we have a dog class. And the dog class has a method bark and a method wag. They each perform separate things and only that. While you can see that in the loosely cohesive system that we have a dog class but it has one method that does everything, and this is really bad programming practice. So while you're implementing your code, it's also very important to test and debug along the way. So what testing is, is when the software engineer creates different things called test cases, which make sure to confirm that their program is acting the way that it should. And if their code isn't acting the way it should, then that's where debugging comes in. And that's where the software engineer will go through their code and find where the error is and then fix it. Okay, so for my problem, um, it's up here, mm -hmm. it's on debugging. Um, so the problem is you got caught up in your code um, for a software program and you wrote all of your code in one method. Like it's, it's all in there. And uh, you write a test to make sure that the outcome uh, is correct and the test fails. You have no clue what's wrong. Um, you only have that one method, so you're not sure where the bug is. I mean, you just don't know. And um, so how do you find that bug? So one of the first things you, you should think of is that you want to test smaller pieces. So there was something we learned in class where you have a forest, right? And you're trying to find a wolf in that forest. What you end up doing is you build a fence through half the forest. You check, oh, is the wolf in here? No. Wolf in, wolf in here? Yes. So then you split that one in half. Say, oh, is it in here? Is it in here? So on and so forth. And so you can find the wolf that way. Um, so you want to do something similar with your um, test cases and with your methods. Um, you should first split your code into smaller methods. Um, and, and the way you want to do this is that um, you're going to take repetitive lines of code and you're going to take codes that do specific functions and you're going to put them in their own method. So um, that's what Megan was saying earlier about making your code um, highly cohesive. So you want different methods that do different things and you want everything loosely coupled, uh, again what Megan was talking about earlier, because um, so that it all works separately. Um, Yes. So now that you have your smaller methods, you want to test them smaller. So um, each method is going to have maybe an if statement or something like that. Maybe it doesn't. But if it does, you're going to want to test those if statements separately. So if this happens, test that. If that if something else happens, test what happens there. Um, and that way you'll be able to um, really hone in on where that bug is in your method. Um, once you find, so you're going to test your code, and um, 
Eclipse or whatever uh, program you use is going to tell you which method is wrong, which one has the code in it, the bug in it, because what you expected to happen didn't actually happen. Um, so now that you know which method it's in, you can uh, then go and use breakpoints. Breakpoints, um, basically what you say is you say, um, I want to have a breakpoint at this line of code. You run your code, it start, it, um, then after that line of code, it, um, you can, it shows you which line is running next. So you run it line by line, and you can check the result from each line. So that'll also help you find out exactly where that bug is, exactly what line that is in, so that you can then go ahead and fix that line of code. Um, so now that you have all that, your code is cleaner, more comprehensive, uh, you know where that big bug is, and you fix it. So to wrap things up, a really great example of where not testing and debugging your code can prove to cause a big problem is when the Ariane 5, a rocket system for delivering satellites into orbit, exploded on June 1996, 40 seconds after takeoff. And the reason it exploded was due to an arithmetic overflow error because they did not fully test all of their code. And this just relates back to what Alex was saying about how important it is that you test your code so that it doesn't prove to be, well in this case, fatal.